All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, can you hear me well? In the back there? OK, cool. Um, my name is Leszek Górniak. I'm a senior technical game designer at Flying Wild Hog. Um, and first of all, I'm, I'm fully aware that uh, the title of this presentation might not be 100% descriptive for all of you. So um, first of all, I want to establish uh, very clearly what, is this, what this talk is about, basically. And yeah, um, uh, I once read the book about giving talks. And in this book, uh, there's one particular advice from this book that I remember very well. And it's, you have to talk about something that fascinates you. Yeah, because it's, it does good for the talk, basically. And audience immediately feels that and, and everything is just well and smooth. So um, in case of this particular topic, I wouldn't say that uh, fascinates is the right word. I wouldn't use that word. I would use the words like uh, uh, irritation, frustration, unbelievable pain. Uh, so, but, but, and that's precisely why I think this topic deserves a lecture. Um, this talk is not about why we create bad games, because this is way too broad topic. It's not for a single lecture. I wouldn't want to tackle it. Um, I just take one very small portion of the problem, which is exactly as the title says, why low quality assets and features end up in released games. But what the title doesn't say, and what is perhaps even more important, uh, is despite us, the developers, knowing about them. So we know that there are some bad assets, there, are some, there is low quality stuff in our game, and finally it lands in the game that's released to the player. So that's the problem I, I, I want to talk about today. Um, and to illustrate this problem, uh, I created this. Uh, this is my homemade visualization of the problem. So let it sink in. I'll give you a few seconds for it to sink in. Um, all right. Uh, so I have two examples to make it even more clear. Uh, I have two examples of situations where bad, low quality assets ended up in final, uh, in released games. And the first one is codenamed Final Placeholders. And once upon a time I worked on this quest um, and I needed um, at some point, I, as a uh, gameplay designer, gameplay scripter, I worked on gameplay sequence, combat objectives, and so on. At some point, I needed the explosion particle. And at the time, um, the approach I considered most appropriate was I just looked through the project what explosion particles are used in other levels, in other quests, and I, um, and I stumbled upon this nice explosion particle with this strange T-E-M-P um, postfix in its name. Um, so wait, my way of thinking was, uh, so yeah, so, I, so I, well, it's used everywhere, so I added it to the game. It didn't really look that bad. By the way, those examples are real life, but details are slightly altered. Um, so those things actually happen. So yeah, so I added this t explosion particle with the TEMP in its name, because my way of thinking was, surely there is some kind of pipeline taking place here, right? If, if there are a lot of assets with TEMP in their name used in the project, probably there's gonna be some kind of visual pass at some point, and someone's going to straighten things up, you know, optimize, um, improve the visuals. Uh, so there's surely some kind of pipeline taking place, right? Right? Yeah, and so uh, unfortunately what happened many months later is that particular assets, along with many other assets with TMP in their names, uh, were released in the final game. So that's the first example, final placeholders. And the second one is, who approved this? Um, one day I worked on the game that featured a dynamic difficulty scaling system. Uh, I joined the project uh, when it was in a more or less advanced stage, so I, I tried to work out how the system worked, and for me it was pretty unclear, not to, man, not to say broken. 
Uh, so I started asking questions. And guess what? Literally not a single person, not a single person I asked, uh, not a single person said that they are happy with the shape of this particular feature. Um, and guess what? A few milestones later, the feature gets released in this very shape, which is broken. Um, so yeah, so this is who approved this. Those are those two examples I wanted to give you to make the subject of this presentation even more clear. And I have a question to all of you. If you could just raise your hands, if you at least once in your game, the industry career, uh, experienced situation more or less like that. Like how many of you experienced situation more or less like that? Oh, yeah, because you know, I was actually afraid that only a few hands will rise and the whole lecture will just be like, completely un, un, non-trustworthy anymore, but so cool. So it's, see, it's quite a common issue. And, and the question is why that happens, why? Um, and, and, and usually when you ask people with a fairly um, a considerable experience in a game industry, I give you one of the three following reasons why it happens. The first one is micromanagement. The second one is demotivated team. People don't care, so they leave bad stuff in the game. And the third one is budget and time constraints. Um, all three of them are super reasonable, and all three of them are valid uh, um, reasons why such things happen. However, I strongly believe, and my practical experience supports it, at least to, to some extent, that there is another very important factor in play. Um, and it's this. Um, somebody will take care of this for sure approach. How many times seeing awful quality in our project, we just thought to ourselves this very phrase or a variation of it. Like for sure someone will notice that there is something wrong. It just, it's, it can't happen that it will be released in this state. Somebody will take care of this for sure. And actually this, uh, this phenomenon is a very well known phenomenon in social psychology. It's called diffusion of responsibility. And, and in my opinion, um, in my opinion, uh, just to phrase it right. Uh, yeah, in my opinion, this diffusion of responsibility or this somebody will take care of this for sure approach is actually often a root cause of either micromanagement, uh, demotivation in the team or budget and, and, and time constraints because you know, division of responsibility forces managers to micromanage. Division of responsibility kills motivation and division of responsibility creates chaos that burns our budget and our time. Um, and yet another um, visualization to illustrate uh, exactly what I have in mind here. Um, yeah. So yes, so that's what I think it's often a root cause. It's often, I would say, it, it doesn't receive enough attention. Um, and I think the most important question is, and what you're probably most interested in, what we are most interested in is what can we do? So we can, we for sure we can do a lot of things to mitigate this. A lot of things, uh, but only two of them that are actually quite similar in, in, in some aspects. Only two of them are subject of my presentation. I, in my opinion, there are two key solutions, among other solutions, that help us fight this particular diffusion of responsibility issue. And the first is formal ownership. Because I strongly believe uh, that this unfortunate final prototype, final white box thing uh, could be avoided if, if, for example, the aforementioned dynamic difficulty scaling system had a formal owner assigned. And in my opinion, every feature and asset needs a formal owner assigned. And what I mean by formal ownership? By formal ownership, I mean uh, the person being responsible for asset or feature or set of assets or set of features who, who drives basically a production pipeline, makes things happen. A person who has required tech, art, or design skills, which differ, differentiates this person from producer, for example. The person who keeps stakeholders up to date with the state of whatever they own and the person who's a go-to person for answering questions. So that the questions like, who can I ask about this? And people like 
not being able to give a straightforward answer to this question, so it just wouldn't happen. Uh, and finally, person responsible for final quality, ensuring that there are no final placeholders in the project. Um, what is actually interesting from my experience to achieve the best results, owners should be chosen from among, not, for, not from among leads or managers, but from regular or senior developers. And not just anyone could be an owner. Uh, the criteria for, for, for selection of owners are a topic for a completely different presentation, so I'm just going to mention it here very briefly that not everyone can be an owner. Owner has to be a person with a very specific attitude, mainly attitude that facilitates finishing stuff. So producers like attitude, I would say. And, and what is very important, and it's, that's, that's often a misconception, owners don't usually design things from scratch. They actually receive uh, high, uh, high level requirements from stakeholders like directors or leads, but then they take them and they see them through to completion and they are responsible and accountable for their quality. And uh, this is a ex simple example, how could this work? Let's imagine that we have a design team in which lead designer leads team of three designers and each of those designers, um, according to their specialization, is responsible for a specific area of the game. Gameplay for enemy encounters, system designer for power-ups, a narrative designer, for example, for visual novels, and which means that those people drive the creation of those features or assets. Basically, they drive them, they meet with other uh, necessary uh, people like artists, like programmers, and they basically drive it. Um, and this is how I, how I at least used to work, and from my experience it boosts productivity immensely. Um, but yeah, but what if, what if for some reason, uh, for different reasons, our project lacks former owners? There's no former ownership included in the official pipeline. So fortunately, there is another very powerful tool at our disposal, and this tool is personal ownership. Uh, and this is when it gets tricky. Um, in my opinion, personal ownership, at least what I, what, what the, the aspect of personal ownership I wanted to focus about is communication, because low quality always follows bad communication in the project. It always does. And, and in every single project I worked on, before the game industry as well. Before the game industry, I worked in the localization industry, in IT industry, in other industries. In every single project, in every single team, there were many people complaining about bad communication. Like, always, every time. And the thing is that people usually expect directors, leads, managers um, to handle that communication with top-down approach. Like people just sit there and they want to be told everything, like what's the current state, what's the situation, like they want to be updated constantly, continuously, right? And, and this is how usually people perceive the flow of communication in the team, that there is person or group of people responsible for it. However, what people often miss is uh, that to actually fix communication problems, the communication cannot only be top down, it has to be bottom up as well, bottom up. And by bottom up, I mean that we are all responsible for it. So every time someone comes to me, for example, and says that there is problem with communication, there's a bad communication, leads are not doing their job when communi communicating things. The first question that I ask is, have you tried to find the information yourself? Have you actually tried to look for information on your own? Because, and especially in creative industry, and especially in game development, communication is a super complicated stuff. The, 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 um, the, the, ex the extent to which uh, uh, things get outdated, you know, uh, things change and shift. Um, we have to actively reach to other team members and look for up-to-date information, and we also, have to keep other team members informed. We cannot rely on, um, on managers doing that. And actually what is, what is even more, I strongly believe that no director, no producer, no lead can by themselves, by communicating things only top down, 
And now there's a long, there's a long phrase. I even wrote it down. Maintain the quality of communication required for the video game production to go smoothly. I think that's impossible. Without us communicating bottom up, the communication will always be flawed. Um, and yeah, going further, there is this book, uh, uh, Extreme Ownership, written by two Navy SEALs. Um, and there is this one um, thing in this book that I uh, particularly like, uh, which they describe as leading up the chain of command. And it's very directly connected with communication, and it's actually connected with something that frustrates us very often as developers, uh, which is the fact that we feel that we don't have influence over the project. And what they claim, and what I fully agree with, that what we can actually do, and we do this through bottom-up communication, we can lead up the chain of command by providing our leads and higher-ups with proper updated information. And this is the best way we can actually shape the project, to lead up the chain of command. It is not possible without bottom-up communication because bad decisions are often made because higher-ups don't have full information. And we are, we are responsible for, this, for sharing this information with them and we cannot rely on this being handled top-down. And a controversial opinion from me, I actually think that remote work is, uh, when you add all these advantages and disadvantages, it's bad for communication. And with hybrid and remote models being more and more widespread right now, it's an even, it's even bigger um, challenge to, to maintain the proper level of communication. So bottom-up communication is even more important right now, the communication that comes from you to everyone else. Um, so yeah, so, 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 so truly I say to you guys, ask for you will not be told, tell for no one else will tell, uh, unfortunately. So yeah, so to, to sum things up, uh, either micromanagement, demotivated team, or budget constraints, that all, all those um, um, aspects could be attributed to final placeholders and who approved these issues and this kind of stuff. But I personally think that, the, that we should pay special attention to this somebody will take care for sure approach, uh, AKA diffusion of responsibility. And, and we can fight it with formal ownership and personal ownership. Formal ownership is more for producers and leads thing because it has to be formally introduced. Personal ownership is we can do this anytime and we should, we all should feel personally responsible for information and flow of information in the team. And what they both have in common is the responsibility. And yeah, and without clear responsibility, we are, unfortunately, we are trapped with the diffusion of responsibility. This someone will take care of this for sure assumption. And I'm telling you what is for sure is one thing, and it's that in way too many cases, nobody will. Thank you very much. And of course, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them to the best of my ability. Doesn't seem to be any, so thank you again. Ah, sorry, sorry, there's one. Mm. How would you approach upper management about this, like, an elevate, if you were to give an elevator pitch on the problem to convince like CEO uh, to uh, introduce formal ownership, uh, what would you say? <laughs> uh, uh, you know what, I would probably just go with this. Uh, basically, I would describe what it's all about and what are the main advantages of it uh, and, 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 and stress the fact that it does mitigate to to much extent the problem of diffusion of, res of responsibility and well and in my and, and i would say that in my opinion diffusion of responsibility is a very undermined and at the same time very huge issue in creative industry especially and i would try to you know determine whether they agree with me or not because if management um, doesn't agree that diffusion of responsibility is a problem then i have a problem convincing them but i believe that sometimes they just can't you know pinpoint it exactly, but when you tell them about it, it becomes more apparent. I see. And one more question. Do you think that maybe more often than not, like everyone is aware and they just leave it because 
you know, maybe players won't notice, maybe uh, no one will care anyway, so why would you spend time or resources on replacing a temporary asset, for instance? <laughs> Uh, sometimes it might be the issue, and in, in one of the examples I gave, the one with particle, this might have been an issue because it's something that could that, that players can basically miss. What, what it actually breaks more, I think, than visuals is it breaks optimization of the game, which is a bigger problem. But in case of broken dynamic difficulty scaling system, which is a key system for the particular game, I don't think this was the mindset, like players won't notice. Oh, I tell you, player notice that. So, so, so no. So, so it depends on the on the scale and severity of the issue. I would say. Was it patched <laughs> after all? <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> well, yeah. So, as you can see, it's pretty serious stuff. <clears throat> I think we still have around eight minutes, so I believe that there is one question there. Okay. Hello, thanks for your talk. Small question. When you explained all of this mess with uh, temp part, uh, for me, uh, the question how many people worked on that? Uh, I, I'm not sure I understand the question. So we have a pro you explained about the project where you have lots of temp arts. Lots of lot temporary of assets. Yes, yes mm -hmm. and lots of assets uh, with bad quality came to production and impacted. So mm -hmm. when we talked about development team artists and so on, all the stuff, people who are like a group of people responsible on it that actually had shared responsibility and failed. Mm -hmm. How many people it was? And what org structure, what processes did they use to make it happen? So, so you ask me what, what it looked like at the time or how I think it should have been? How it looked at the time that it, uh, that it was possible? So it, well, it basically looked at the time in a way that gameplay, that gameplay designers were just placing things in the level according to their better judgment, expecting some kind of visual polish stage to take place at some point, but it never did. But about what amount of people around all of this process are we talking? 30. Okay. 30, I would say. And how many teams? Four. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so I don't know if it answers your question. Yeah, it answers. Okay. It's interesting because uh, for me, it uh, looks like it's uh, not enough maybe org structure processes that even QAing uh, some life cycle of any asset that can be done even I mean, with Jira. I mean, yeah, I fully agree that there was definitely something missing in the process. Yeah, and, in, and actually, in my opinion, formal ownership could at least to a huge extent fix this issue. Because for all, the one of, of the um, com competences and responsibilities of the owner is to make sure that, that, that uh, things are of a final acceptable quality when they go to this acceptance stage, I would say. Totally agree, but uh, do you think that all the stuff should be like informal ownership, any small task, or it can be like team ownership? Of course, of course it can be. And there are many kinds of ownership. A formal ownership with a single person being owner is just one. I would say another extreme is this personal ownership, when ownership is distributed, but we can trust people that they feel they own things and they communicate things. Like, for example, someone communicate to art team, hey, I use this temporary asset, do something about it, because nobody did, because they just thought that art somehow magically knows about it, right? So, so there, there are many ways, and at the same, I, I fully agree that something like team ownership could also be introduced in a way that, for example, a certain strike team is just responsible and accountable for the quality of assets in, in, uh, in a given milestone or whatever, right? It just has to be very clearly said, because the, the problem with diffusion of responsibility is that people just don't know who's responsible. And that's what I observe in the game project way too often. Thank you. I think that's it. So thank you very guys. Thank you very much guys again and and have a nice rest of GIC.